Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. First Chronicles chapter 12. Hope you have a Bible. This is, would be a difficult night. That probably should have been part of the warning. Uh, to sit and listen to a lecture, which this is not, uh, in First Chronicles, that is, not having the ability to look down and read the text as we go along, would be even more difficult. So we encourage you to have a Bible, to bring a Bible. You know, for that matter, bring it with you throughout the day and carry it around with you. And when you have a spare moment, look at it, read it, read ahead, soak yourself in it. But uh, we are in, uh, and if you don't have a Bible, there's one close by you in the, under the chair in front of you, no doubt. So we're in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Now, if you were, happen to be reading this in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, which I don't think we have many of you here that would, but if you were reading the book of Chronicles, and in he the Hebrew Bible, it's one book. The name of the book in Hebrew is Divare Hayamim. That's the Hebrew title for the Chronicles. And what it literally means is the words of the days. The words of the days. These are the chronicles or the words of the days of the children of Israel, especially the kingdom. It is a history of how God deals with his people. The history of Israel is the history of God dealing with humanity and bringing us all the way to the time of the Messiah. At least it points us in that direction. So these are the words of the days. Now we told you before, and I am repeating now, it is more than just a history. We have history in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and much of the same events are covered. However, this is more than history. This is more than chronology. This is more than genealogy. This really is a divine editorial on Israel's history. It is the history, the words of the days from a divine perspective. And so the author, by the Spirit of God, is very selective in leading you along a journey through the kingdom. So chapters 1 through 9, all those names we covered in the first week. Yes, we covered nine chapters, sort of. We flew over them, but we, we, got, uh, we dipped our toe into those nine chapters in our first study. Chapter 1 through 9 is the first section of the book, of First Chronicles. Uh, it's all about the genealogical records that bring, bring you up to King David. And then chapters 10 through 29 is this second section. So we are in this second section. Chapter 1 through 9, David's rightful ancestry from Adam to David. It covers 3,000 years in nine chapters through a list of names, 3,000 years, chapters 1 through 9. The second section, chapters 10 through 29, is David's royal activities. And it covers about 30 or 40 years. Uh, it's, it's a longer section. It covers less time. So we have from Adam to David, chapters 1 through 9, and then we have David all the way to the end of his reign when Solomon is introduced toward the end of the book. Where we presently are in chapter 12 is going back before David was king. Now you say, what do you mean before David was king? Last week when we were together in chapters 10 and 11, David was crowned king by the people of Israel and Hebron. Now the author goes back before that time to give you a little bit of background on David's men, his armies, and how the group of fighting men gathered around David to bring him 
to the place where they all recognized he was God's next king after Saul. So we are going back a little bit, chronologically, to the time when Saul was the king and David was a fugitive, running away because Saul had threatened his life. You may recall when David's wife, uh, Michael, or Mikael, was uh, married to David early on, and she said, look, you know, unless you hide yourself and then run away, my dad's going to kill you. And so he ran away. And he was a fugitive from King Saul for a period of 10 years. Imagine being on the run when your life is threatened and the most powerful person in the nation, the king himself, is trying to find you and kill you and pays people off and bribes people and sends people out to find you, has all that wealth at his disposal to hunt you down and take you out. So David was a fugitive. He was protected by God. And we know the chronology. We've already studied it though it's been a while, when we were in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. But let me just remind you, and I touched on this last week when I made that crack about my pastoral staff, self-included, that David was running away from Saul. He was in the wilderness uh, in the cave of Abdul Adullam. And it says, all those who were in debt, all those who were distressed, all those who were discontent, just the dregs of society, they came to David in the cave of Adullam, and they became David's mighty men. And there were at the time 400. So more and more people came to David in the wilderness and came to David later on when he moves down south, as you'll see in a moment, and then later on even more until he has, well, a few hundred thousand men around him by the time he takes over as the king of Israel. So the numbers are growing. We get to that in verse 1 of chapter 12. Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men helpers in the war. Let me just jog your memory. David, fleeing from Saul, one day says, you know, he's going to kill me. As long as I'm in the country, I'm not safe. I'm going to defect to Philistine country. So he goes to King Achish in the city of Gath, the capital of the Philistine stronghold. And he... Uh, moves in, becomes a mercenary hired by the king of the Philistines to make attacks on Israel. So he is defected from King Saul. He is now protected by King Achish. He's in the city of Gath. The city of Gath is an ancient town with walls around it, unable to assume David and all of his men that are starting to follow him. So he asks King Achish, look, just let me have a, a, a town. Give me an area that I can just live in with my men and we'll do your bidding. We'll be your mercenaries. We'll attack your enemies. So the king of Gath, King Achish, gave him the town of Ziklag, way down south, down by Beersheba, down by the Gaza Strip, about 25 miles from the capital city of Gath. So David was out of sight, sort of out of mind for the Phil from the Philistines. You've probably heard the saying, bloom where you're planted. So here David is planted in Philistine country in the outpost of Ziklag, and he's blooming where he is planted. All things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. David, for 16 months, that's how long he is living in Philistine country, for 16 months under King Achish. Achish thinks, yeah, he's just, you know, he's a vassal. He's doing my bidding. He's against the Israelites. 
What David is using the time for is very significant. For 16 months, David is able to study the geography of Philistine country. He is able to study the intrigues of Philistine warfare. He is also able to attack the southern tribes that are attacking the south, both Israel and Philistine country, and eliminate the threat of these stray tribal groups so that when he becomes the king over Israel, he will have eliminated his enemies in the south in advance, will know the workings of the Philistines in depth, because when he is the king of Israel, the Philistines are going to attack him because he is now against them when he was for a while for them. So David goes down to Ziklag, down to the southern outpost. He is armed with bows, all these men who are with him, armed with bows using, I like this, both the right hand and the left hand in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. They were men of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. King Saul was a Benjamite. Now a whole group of Benjamites, fierce warriors, are defecting from King Saul and following David, even though David is living in Philistine country. And their description is pretty interesting. They're ambidextrous. They're able to use the right hand as equally as well, uh, the left hand as equally as well as the right hand. They can throw Equally with the left hand as the right hand, they can shoot their bows and arrows, left-handed, right-handed. So they're a handy group of guys, um, pun intended. Uh, and uh, they surround David from the town, uh, from the group of the Philistines. Their names are listed. I am not going to bore you with trying to pronounce their names or mispronounce their names. Um, Go down to verse 8. Some Gadites also joined David. So David's army is growing down south. The Gadites joined David at the stronghold in the wilderness. Mighty men of valor, trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces are like the faces of lions, and they were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. So they had capabilities in offense and capabilities in defense. They were very fierce in their countenance, and it speaks of their aggressive nature in offense, but also if they're being attacked, they can run really fast. So they're good offensively, they're good defensively, and their names are mentioned. I'm taking you now down to verse 14. These were from the sons of Gad, captains of the army. The least was over a hundred. The greatest was over a thousand. So they're great offensively. They're great defensively. They're great administratively. These are the ones who crossed the Jordan, that is the Jordan River, in the first month when it had overflowed all its banks and they put to flight all those in the valleys to the east and to the west. I like these guys. To cross the Jordan in the uh, first month means April, uh, March, end of March, beginning of April, the first Jewish month. It is uh, the end of the winter rains. It's the um, latter rains that caused the Jordan River to swell up. So the river would be running faster than usual. It would be higher than normal. They didn't care. They would cross it. They would swim against the current and manage to get over and uh, be fierce warriors no matter what the obstacle. And there are those kind of people. Obstacles seem to just put a smile on their face. The harder it is, really, well, watch this. And uh, the more opposition they get, the fiercer they fight. I have a friend like that. His name is Franklin Graham. Uh, he runs Samaritan's Purse and Billy Graham organization. And the higher, the bigger the obstacle, he, you know, he doesn't care. So when there was a, a war in Somalia, in Mogadishu, Somalia, 
And uh, a fa famous movie was based on that, Black Hawk Down. Franklin asked me if I wanted to go. Well, I didn't really want to go, but he told me that I ought to go with him, so I did, because he decided, I'm going to run a mission in the middle of this war. I'm going to get the protect protection of the U.S. military, and I've already uh, made contacts, and we have uh, people who are on the ground. We're going to rescue children during this war. We're going to minister to them. And so they set up this medical clinic and orphanage in Mogadishu, Somalia, and I went with him. And um, when we were, well, when we were at the airport and my wife was seeing me off, Franklin, instead of saying, hey, man, God bless you, brother, he said, are you ready to die? <laughs> and I looked over at Lenya to see what she would do with that information. And she just got wide-eyed and, uh, you know, he, he didn't take it back. But he said, we're going into some dangerous country. But all that aside, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds of that story. He just... God has put that in his heart, like these guys, cross the Jordan, swim against the current. Who cares what the opposition is? Let's expand the kingdom. Let's get the gospel out. And God is using him uh, greatly around the world with Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Association. Then, verse 16, some of the children of Benjamin and Judah came to David in the stronghold. So again, the army is growing. More and more people are gathering around David. David went out to meet them and answered and said to them. So they're crossing the Jordan. David doesn't really know exactly who they are at this point. So David goes down to meet them. And he said to them, If you have come peaceably to me to help me, my heart will be united with you. But if to betray me to my enemies... Since there is no wrong in my hands, may the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. It's kind of an interesting greeting. Don't know who you are, but if you're here because you want to be loyal to the cause, I'm your best friend. If you're here to spy on me and betray me, now watch what he says. If you're here to betray me, he doesn't say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to attack you. I'm going to get back at you. But he commits them to the Lord. May the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. Here's a good principle on how to deal with people you are uncertain about. Why not just welcome them in the name of the Lord? Yeah, but we don't know. You know, I've been burned before. So have I many times. So was Jesus. You don't think he knew what Judas was up to when he chose Judas to be his follower? In advance, he knew what was going to go down. He chose Peter knowing Peter would deny him. So when you're uncertain about people, instead of saying, you know, if they get me, I'm going to get them. How about I'm going to commit them to the Lord? I'm going to let the Lord deal with them, you know? The Lord wants to be your defense. And I've learned that God is a great defense. And he is a great, if, if people attack you, he's a great one to have as your front and rear guard. He's really good at payback. Better than I am. But I've also learned this. If you want to defend yourself, God will let you. He'll let you defend yourself, be frustrated, be angry, be bitter, try to figure out the intrigue. Better to just say, you know, I don't really get you or understand you, but I welcome you. I hope you mean well and you will do well. If not, I am just committing you and commending you to the Lord. He'll judge between us. He'll handle it. And God does a much better job uh, than I do. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, the chief of the captains, and he said, We are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers. For your God helps you. So David received them. Now watch this. And made them captains of the troop. Evidently, he liked what he heard, and he 
put them in a leadership position. They just crossed over the Jordan. And sometimes the Jordan River is seen as a crossing from the old life into the new life, the new land. They're going over to the promised land like through Joshua. This could even be a picture of baptism. They cross through the waters. They've been saved. They're called. They've been saved and baptized. And David puts them in a position of service. If you are a saved believer, if you believe in Jesus Christ, God has called you to serve him. Yes, I know there's a time when you want to look at a person and equip the person and not put them too quickly. But I think it's good. I think it's healthy to begin in some capacity to serve the body of Christ immediately. Plug in. Do something. Learn how to serve instead of like waiting 20 years and then, you know, uh, okay, uh, you've drugged me into it. Now I'm going to serve. Just learn from the very beginning to serve God's people. So he received them, made them captains of the troop. And some from Manasseh defected to David or leaving Saul or going over to David. When he was going with the Philistines to battle against Saul... But they did not help them, for the lords of the Philistines sent him away by counsel, saying, he may defect to his master Saul and endanger our heads. Now, this is a reference to the last battle that King Saul will ever fight. You remember the battle on Mount Gilboa? We opened the um, chapter 10 with, uh, when Saul and his son Jonathan and Malchishua, when they died with the children of Israel in that last battle, battle of his life with the Philistines. The Philistines won. The Israelites were defeated. King Saul died. This is the last battle. At that last battle in other books before this, back in the book of Kings, Samuel and Kings, David, uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, uh, David comes to Gath, comes to King Achish, offers himself as a fighting group he and his men. They're going to meet Saul, the Philistines are, up in the north and fight the battle. David says, I'll go with you. I'll fight with you against Saul. And so Achish says, good, you and your men, we could use your help. The lords or the generals of the Philistine army says, oh no, you're not going to bring David here. I know David has defected to us, but in the heat of the battle, here's a guy who has loved Saul for a long time, even though Saul has been against him. We know his history. And it could be in the heat of the battle when he sees the battle turning against us in some capacity, he's going to join King Saul and defend him and fight against us, not for us. So he could be a double agent. And so King Achish took their advice and said, you know, sorry, Dave, you have to go back to Ziklag and hang out there. You can't come to battle with us. So David went back down to Ziklag, and when he came back, do you remember what he found? They had kidnapped his children, his wives, the wives of the people in the town, and burned the city with fire. And so David came back, took care of that business, restored uh, that which was taken, and that's the reference here, this battle against the Philistines. So now go down to verse 22. For at that time they came to David day by day. This is all the people, the army men, the capable men. They came to David day by day to help him until it was a great army like the army of God. Now, we also have, beginning in verse 23, more people defecting, not when he's at Ziklag, but when he is up in Hebron. Now, do you remember... David at first was not the king over all of Israel, but only the king of Judah, and his headquarters was at Hebron. For seven years he ruled over Judah in Hebron. I told you there were three anointings of David last week. Anointing number one, when he was a kid, and Samuel came to Jesse's house, his dad's house, and David was anointed then with oil. Anointing number two, when David was at Hebron and he was anointed king over Judah, the southern tribes. 
And then the third anointing is when all of Israel has eventually ceded the kingdom to David and they acknowledge he is God's chosen. And uh, that's the third and final anointing. So uh, the army keeps growing. David is at Hebron. I want to take you down to verse 30 because there's a couple verses that just need to be looked at. Of the children of Ephraim, 20,800. That's a far cry from 400 men in the cave of Adullam. 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men throughout their father's house. And of the tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 who were designated by name to come and make David king. Now, go down to verse 33. Of Zebulun, there were 50,000 who went out to battle, expert in war with all weapons of war, stout-hearted, or some translations say single-hearted, single-minded, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. Now you say, skip you, uh, skip, you skipped a verse. And I did. I skipped verse 32 because I wanted to show you the massive numbers of these people. But now look at verse 32. Of the children of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200. 200. Not 50,000. Not 28,000. 200. And all their brethren were at their command. These were 200 representatives of the tribe that joined these, this group. It doesn't say they were men of valor. It doesn't say they were lean, mean, fighting machines. And there was a small number of them. You know, the Marines will tell you they only want a few good men. Because, as we've said before, you can sometimes do more with a few good men than with a whole bunch of not-so-good men, not-so-fine men. So you got, you got few, a few ordinary men, and what God can do with a few, few ordinary men and women is pretty amazing because we get a description of these guys. It said, the children of Issachar who had understanding of the times. I've done a whole sermon on the weekend on the children of Issachar, the men of Issachar. But it says they had understanding of the times. What does that mean? They understood the unique perils, the dangers of the times they were living in. What was that? That the king was Saul, and they're with David, and Saul is trying to kill David, and they have to be very careful with their going forward strategy because of the times in which they were living in. But they understood their times. I hope you are people who understand the times that we are living in. Unique, perilous, dangerous times. Remember what Jesus said. He goes, you know, you get up in the morning and you see a, um, or at night you see a, a red sky and you know it's going to be fair weather tomorrow morning. You get up in the morning, you see a red sky, you know it's going to be um, a, a stormy day, right? Like the old saying goes. A red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Uh, those who grew up on the ocean especially know that. And so they can, they can discern the sky. Jesus said, you are hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And Christians, we should discern the the signs of the times in which we live. We are living in perilous times. You know what's going on around the world. And if you're informed biblically, you see that this is happening exactly as predicted in the scripture. And so you are aware, you are informed, you understand the times. This is why we study prophecy, by the way. Some people go, well, I'm just not into prophecy. Well, then you've just eliminated over one-fourth of your Bible. 
because a fourth plus 26, 27 percent of your Bible, almost a third, is prophetic. Jesus held the people of Jerusalem accountable for not discerning that time. When he came into Jerusalem on a donkey, predicted by Daniel the prophet, by the way, which gave the very time the Messiah would enter Jerusalem, he said, if only you would have known the things that make for your peace in this your day. But they are hidden from your eyes. Therefore, your enemies will surround you and conquer you. You won't know what's coming, basically. And judgment was pronounced. So be men and women of Issachar, those people who understand their times, the perilous times, the perilous election coming up, the perilous thing happening in the Ukraine over in Israel, etc. They had understanding of their times to know what Israel ought to do. So be informed, read, read your Bibles, read the newspaper, understand what is going on, be equipped, learn how to both be salt and light to be one that knows how to preserve yourself and preserve your family and at the same time influence the world around you. And third, be engaged. Get involved. Learn the issues. Learn the policies in this upcoming election. Learn who is for what issue. Dig a little. You've got a computer. You've got a phone. You can find out what every judge in this city that is up for re-election, what every uh, congressman, when they don't put their um, status, what, what their party is, you can learn what they're for and what they're against and do it intelligently. Edmund Burke was the one who said, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. You and I cannot afford to live in oblivion. We should be registered to vote. We should go to the voting block. We should be influencing people, witnessing to people in our city, in our nation, in our neighborhood. We have to get involved. I heard of a, uh, a company that makes bumper stickers, and they have very inventive bumper stickers, just blank. There's absolutely nothing on it. That's for people who just don't want to get involved. You can't afford to be a person who doesn't get involved. You have a voice. Use it. So all these men gathered into David, verses 38, all these men of war who could keep ranks came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. And they were there with David three days eating and drinking for their brethren had prepared for them. So they're having just a big celebration Moreover, those who were near to them from as far away as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali were bringing food on donkeys, camels, mules, oxen, provisions of flour and cakes of figs, cakes of raisins, wine and oil, and oxen and sheep abundantly. I love this. For there was joy in Israel. When the king is crowned, joy is great. And the king is now being crowned in Hebron by the people. The army of 400 has grown. Now it's a movement gathering around David, recognizing the anointing that is on his life. And there's joy. They crown the king and everybody's filled with joy. When Jesus is your king and you crown him king, there will be joy in your life. Even if you don't understand your life, even if you look at your life and go, what a mess. But Jesus is king. He is in control. So, God, your property is a mess. you got to do something. That's the best way to approach it. Then David, verse 1 of chapter 13, consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said, 
to all the congregation of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel, and with them to the priests and the Levites, who are in their lands, their common lands, that they may gather together to us. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us. Beautiful. Here David is crowned as king, and the first thing he wants to do is a spiritual policy. Let's bring the ark back. The ark for a hundred years has been resting in, in the back of some dude's house. And so he wants to bring it back and have a spiritual emphasis. However, and I have a hunch a lot of you know the story. You know that what David wants to do is a good intention, but he, he goes about it the wrong way. It's the right thing done the wrong way. So in all of this wrangling and plan making and figuring it out and consulting with everybody around him, he asks everybody's counsel except the most important one. What does God want? He says, well, you know, if you guys think it's a good idea and if the Lord's in it, you know, that's good. He kind of threw that in. But he, there's never a record that he asked God what to do. If he would have, in the very least, a priest should have come up and said, okay, if you're going to do this thing, here's how you do it. But nobody stepped up. Maybe they hadn't been reading their Bibles. They didn't know the law. But David should have at least asked the Lord what to do. He consulted everybody else but him. But he wants to bring the ark back, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Then all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor in Egypt, as far as the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kiriath, Yarim. Now remember, the ark we're talking about is the ark of the covenant. It's a box. It was the box where God's presence dwelt all the way back from the time of Moses. The ark of the covenant was a box that was about 45 to 50 inches long, 25 to 30 inches tall, and I say 25 to 30 because it depends on which cubit you are using. So about, let's say, 50 inches long, 30 inches tall, uh, and um, uh, 30 inches across. And the top of it, it was made out of wood, covered with gold. The lid was solid gold, and there were golden angels, cherubim, whose wings touched in the center. Inside, there was a copy of the law. There was Aaron's rod that budded, there was a jar of manna, all emblematic of God's presence with the children of Israel during their wilderness march. It was in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, which had been at Shiloh. Do you remember that? But Israel was once fighting the Philistines. They're always fighting the Philistines during this era. And in one particular battle, some lame brain in Israel said, hey, you know, let's bring the ark out of the tabernacle at Shiloh and bring it into the camp where we're fighting, which was a no-no. And surely the presence of God will be with us and we'll win the battle. So they began looking at the ark like a lucky charm, a good luck charm. So they brought it into the camp. The Philistines heard the Israelites in the camp next door, the Israelites, you know, thundering with applause. And they said, man, what's going on over in the Israelite camp? And the Philistine says, their God has come into the camp. They brought their ark into the camp. And so the Philistines said, man, we better fight harder than usual. And they did, and they won. And the Philistines then captured the ark for themselves and brought it into their camp, took it into the temple of their god named Dagon. It was sort of like, we've captured your god. Our god's better than your god. 
And then they started parading the ark to different cities of the Philistines. And which every, every city they went to, boils started breaking out on the Philistine men, these little tumors. And so they finally were taking it into Ekron. The men of Ekron said, don't you bring that thing in this town. We've heard what goes on. Whenever that thing is around, we don't want it. So they decided, well, what do we do with it? Well, let's, let's, bring it let's put it on a cart and hook the cart up to oxen. And if the, ark goes, the oxen go, uh, the cows go right into the children of Israel's camp, we know that it's the God's will that we got rid of it. So they brought it right back to Israel. So Israel now has the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines. It's in the town of Beth Shemesh. This is all just southwest of Jerusalem. The men of the town, the Jewish town, the Jewish people in Beth Shemesh decide to open the Ark and just like look inside, just show and tell. Bring your Ark to school. Let's see what's in it. And when they did, God killed thousands of them for that breach of holiness. So now they don't know what to do. So they leave it in a guy's house in Beth Shemesh called Abinadab for years. Until David, a century later, says, let's bring the ark back. The people go, yeah, awesome, let's bring that baby back. Well, watch. David and all Israel went up to Baalah, to Kiriath Jearim, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of the Lord God who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio. Ahio, of course, is that state that is, oh no, that's Ohio. This is Ahio drove the cart. And David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, with trumpets. What a worship service. Biggest worship service they've had in years, hands down. Why do you think David said, let's put that thing on a cart. Let's make a new cart for it. Well, the Philistines put it on a cart. I mean, keep in mind that a cart was like the latest technology. It was cart technology. However, God was pretty old school. And rather than having them copy the world, emulate the things of the world, do it like the world does, God had very strict specifications of what they were to do. On the Ark of the Covenant, there were little ringlets on the corners, and there were these long staves or poles that went through the ringlets, and you weren't to touch the Ark. You were to take the pole and put it through the ringlets, and put the other side the same way and have a couple of priests uh, on one end and the other on the other end and carry it covered that way. But come on, times have changed. We should use the new technology. Get a, a new cart and do it that way. Let's transport the ark that way. You know. It's sort of like saying, you know, we have a Ford F-150 pickup truck. Just put that baby in the back of the bed of the truck and let's just get it to Jerusalem. It's nine miles. Let's get it there quickly. If you walk it, it'll take a lot longer than if you put it on a cart and the animals pull it. Okay. And when they came to Kaidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. Now that's you would think a good thing, right? I mean, this guy sees what, what needs to be done and uh, he is driven to fix it, um, to meet that need. So he steadies it. He didn't want 
you know, the ark of God fallen down in the, in the rut in the road. Okay, now keep in mind, it's a great worship service. Everybody's rejoicing and the band's playing and, and uh, hands are raised and it's just a glorious, happy time. And God's about to end it. The anger of the Lord was aroused against Yuza and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark and he died there before the Lord. Evidently, God wanted that thing to be carried the way he said to carry it. Old school. In fact, God even said in the Old Testament, you use the poles to carry it, don't touch it lest you die. He touched it. He died. Sometimes, because we want to be pragmatic, we think the end justifies the means. Okay, if God said that the ark should be in Jerusalem, they said, move it there. The end will justify the means. We'll, we'll, we'll take it in the cart. Does the end always justify the means? Ask Abraham and Sarah. God said, you're going to have a kid. She's infertile. Well, if you take Hagar and have sex with her, she'll have a baby, and we'll call it our baby. We'll call that the fulfillment of God's command. So they had Ishmael. And God came back to Abraham and Sarah and said, that's not what I meant. What I meant is Sarah, who is infertile, I'm going to miraculously open her womb, and she is going to have your baby. That's what I meant. The end doesn't justify the means. So Yuza is out there to steady the ark. The anger of the Lord was roused against Yuga, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died before the Lord. I understand the good intention, but like we said Sunday, this last weekend, good intentions aren't always God's intentions. And the key to success is finding God's intention and, and getting in the flow. Not just the thing he wants done, but the manner in which he wants it done. And by the way, God doesn't need you to give him a hand. Well, let's help God out. That's Sarah and Abraham. Let's help God out a little bit. I know he said his son. That's sort of an enigmatic thing since we're both unable to have children. So let's just do, let's help him out and get this thing done. God doesn't need your hand to steady him. Now, verse 12, David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? Well, David, you've got a little bit of a problem just in that question. The issue isn't bringing the ark of God to you. It's bringing you to the ark of God. And yes, it's going to go in Jerusalem, but it has to be done the right way. And he will learn the lesson. We'll learn next time as we get into it. But let's finish this chapter. So David's afraid. Others say he was very disappointed. He was very discouraged. He was angry with God. David would not move the ark, verse 13, with him into the city of David. But he took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, I'm sure Obed-Edom, when they said, hey, can we, uh, can we stick the ark that just killed this dude and killed 50,000 men up? In can, we, can we store it at your house? I'm, th I'm sure he's going, oh, no, not that, not the ark. I'm doomed. But he said, of course. He opened up his property the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house for three months. Now watch this. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. What, is, what does that mean? Well, he blessed him financially, but he blessed him with many children. They will be talked about later on. His family will grow and it will grow strong. Here's a man who made room for God. And God blessed him. Just make room for God. Just use what you have and make room for him. Now, um, you know, we've got four minutes. 
King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David with cedar trees, masons, carpenters, to build him a house. David perceived that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted because of his people, Israel. He got the confirmation. King Hiram of Tyre, the Phoenician king, sent cedars of Lebanon, logs with which he could build uh, the inside of his house, line it with cedar. Can you imagine having a whole... Have you ever, you've ever had a cedar chest growing up? You know how that smells? How good cedar wood smells? Imagine your whole house lined with cedar wood. Just... You know, you don't want to leave home, man. That's just... His, that's awesome. He just sort of... He's smelling the wood. And he's going, yeah, man, God's blessing is pretty awesome. And he just, just dawns on him. Here I was a shepherd kid, and now I got this, and I'm the king of his people. David, unfortunately, took more wives in Jerusalem, and David begot more sons and daughters. Of course, that's not approved by God. And these are the names of his children whom he had in Jerusalem, and their names are given. Okay. Deuteronomy 17, 17. You may just want to jot that down, look at it later. God said, whenever a king arises among you, he shall not, and I am underlining shall not, multiply wives unto him. Why would God even say that? Because typically monarchs had a harem. And they had many wives to accommodate their harem. So David, against the will of the Lord, against Deuteronomy 17, against Genesis, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be joined unto his wife, singular, not wives, plural. Now maybe David was thinking, well, I'm not really multiplying wives, I'm just adding wives. Solomon, of course, will come later on, and he will definitely multiply wives. He'll have 700 of them, plus 300 other wives, concubines, so 1,000 women running around his house. No wonder he had problems. <laughs> I'm not saying it was the wives' problems. It was his, his choice uh, problem. Let me quickly move on. Verse 8. Now, but come on, we have two minutes left. No problem. Now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel... All the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went out against them. You see what's happening? David once worked for the Philistines. He worked for King Achish in Gath, in Ziklag. He was a vassal of them. And it would seem that the Philistines really didn't mind that David was king over Judah for seven years, now that he's king over all the united tribes of Israel, north and south, this poses a great problem to them, and so they want to attack. The Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of God. Finally, he's now praying about things. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord said, go up. I will deliver them into your hands. So... They went up to Pale, uh, Pale, Baal Perazim. David defeated them there. David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, they called the name of that place the Master of Breakthroughs, which is what Baal Perazim means, the Master of Breakthroughs. And when they left their gods there, that cracks me up. They, they have to carry their gods with them. They had little statues. And they carried them to battle. And they carried them. But, you know, uh, the, David's defeating them. They had to just, like, drop their little god and run. If you have to carry your god with you, you've got the wrong god. <laughs> Remember what David said in Psalm 115, Our God dwells in the heavens. Their gods are made of silver and gold. They have eyes, uh, but they don't see. They have mouths, but they don't speak. Ears, but they don't hear. Noses, but they don't smell. Feet, but they can't walk. Hands, but they can't handle. And those who worship them become like them. If you have a false god and you worship a false god, you become false. You become like what you worship. 
So they left their gods and they ran. They were defeated. The Philistines once again made a raid. Da David inquired again of God, and God said, You shall go up after them, circle around them, and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear a sound marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, you shall go out to battle, for God has gone before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So a different strategy than before. I like that David prayed a second time, don't you? He could have thought, you know, I know what they're going to do. They're going to do what they did last time. They're going to raid and attack. I know Philistine strategy. I've been with them 16 months. But he asked God, and God says, do it differently this time. And he said, when you hear the sound in the mulberry trees, don't go up after them. Circle around them. Come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching on the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did as God commanded, and they drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer. The fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Now we just done covered three chapters. Now thank you. Baal Parazim, the god of breakthroughs, just like water rushes, God has broken through. Some of you need a breakthrough. Jesus in the New Testament said, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow torrents of living water. This he spoke of his Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray that you be filled afresh with God's Holy Spirit, whatever you're facing, and that God for you this week will be the God of your breakthrough. Lord, you know what each individual person needs. You know us by name. You call us by name. You know the intricacies of our health, our family, our finances, our situation. Some of us need you to break through. And Lord, we pray that as you fill us with your spirit, that out of our lives will flow rivers of living water and we'll see that expressed and experienced in our situation this week. Work through these ordinary men and women like the children of Issachar. Give us an understanding of our times to know what we ought to do, what the nation ought to do. Keep us informed. Keep us engaged. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.